Welcome to the third section of building responsive data visualizations with D3, Responsive Visualization Strategies. In the last section, we covered tooltips, scales, and axes. In video 3.1, I'm defining responsive and mobile-first design. We'll be looking at why mobile-first has become important. We'll then move on to creating a grid-based site layout that helps our mock-up fluidly transition. Since 2007, laptop and desktop penetration have remained relatively unchanged. The biggest shift has been to mobile user growth mobile users now outnumbering desktop and laptop users worldwide. The growth of mobile for all types of media consumption, as well as the proliferation of tons of different screen sizes and resolutions, has led to the growth of responsive and mobile-first design. The term responsive design was coined by Ethan Marcotte in a 2010 article on alistapart.com, predictably titled Responsive Web Design. In the article, responsive design is likened to the emerging discipline of responsive architecture, in which physical spaces respond to the people who pass through them. As far as the definition of responsive design, you can see Ethan's comments on the screen. Ethan focuses on three core techniques for keeping your projects responsive. One, a fluid foundation. Two, flexible content. This is where D3 comes in. And three, media queries. A fluid foundation involves moving away from pixel measurements and towards proportions onto which a page can be divided. This is where the mobile first aspect comes into play. If you can establish a fluid foundation that gives crucial info and functionality to users on the smallest devices, scaling up should be a piece of cake. Starting mobile first is also practical, as there's more of a standard smallest screen size developers deal with than a largest screen size. So if we can make a site or visualization work in the context of a 300 pixel wide screen, we can then use a proportion-based styling and some media queries to make similar designs work on larger screen. If nothing else, you'll have more room with which to get your design across to visitors. Flexible content is where D3 and SVGs become involved. If we build off of a flexible base, we can create visualizations with SVGs that redraw themselves and that work in a variety of sizes, something we'll see later in this section. A good example of how seamlessly D3 can redraw SVGs can be seen on this example from brendansodal.com. With a self-updating donut chart, this is also responsive. Note how not even the animations are disturbed by changing screen sizes. Enough talking now. Let's move into the editor and get some hands-on experience with a small grid and making it flexible. As you may know, an iPhone screen is 320 pixels wide. So let's start by making a common column-based layout with a width of 300. Inside of your basic boilerplate, paste the following code. This is a common layout that we're going to make into a grid. One row with a span four column, a second row with a span one and a span three column, a third row with two span two columns, in a final row with four span one columns. With a little bit of CSS, we can make our grid visible. Enter the following into the style tag of your header. Note that we've set our body to 300 pixel width to approximate the width of an iPhone screen, and we've centered it with its margin. We've then divided the 300 pixels width into denomination the fourths. Well, almost. Once we've accounted for the 10 pixel margin right, it's attached to all of the elements. So we've subtracted 10 px from the 300 px container width for every element in a given row and then divide it by 1, 2, 3, or 4. This is noted in 65, 140, 2010, and 290. We've also given each span its own color so that we can see what's going on in the browser. Let's open up the browser now to check on the result. It looks about how you would expect a 300 pixel grid to look like. However, our design is still fixed width, and so not really supportive of fluid transitions, different sizes of screens. Let's continue on to alter our column layout and base it upon proportions so that it adjusts depending on the screen size. For this, we'll need to use a commonly used formula in responsive design. Target width divided by context. This should give us a decimal that we can then convert into a percent. Let's jump back into the editor to check it out. Here we've taken the previous pixel widths of our span and margin right property and divided them by the context area, or 300px. But we want fluid transitions, not simply a 300px body width for every screen size. So we should change the body element to a width of 90%, which with the margin centering the body will leave about 5% free space on either side of the screen. If you don't follow how we got our proportion-based measurements for our margin right and width for our span, do the math detailed in the comments to the right of every span. Walking through one more time, we essentially took the pixel value that was the previous width and divided it by the total width of the context, 300px, after subtracting the number of margin rights that have been applied to that row. Let's jump into the browser to see our new, new slightly more flexible layout. When you resize your browser, it's starting to look a little bit more like what people normally expect when they say a page is responsive. But it's missing one component, the content. 
Plus, you would probably never want it. a series of 110 pixel height divs for a full-size screen. So that's where we're going to head in the next video, where we'll look at media queries and how, how they can help us to provide additive CSS for a number of different screen sizes in which our content doesn't quite fit our site layout neatly. But before we go, let's review what we covered in this section, including the basics of responsive and mobile-first design, making grid site layouts, and using percentage and proportion-based designs. The next video is on using media queries and addressing breakpoints. See you then!